Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Judith Barr, a curatorial assistant in the Antiquities Department at the Getty Villa Museum in Los Angeles, California, home to the Getty's collection of ancient Greek, Roman, and Etruscan art. Today's program is part of the Getty's Art Break series. We take inspiration from an object in the Getty's collection or special exhibitions to encourage new conversations about ancient art and culture. Today, we're taking a closer look at a small fragment of linen, one of the bandages used for the mummified human remains of the ancient Egyptian Petosiris. And I'm very pleased to welcome Haba Abd el an an Egyptologist here with us today, to discuss the history and the future of how museums, museums present and how visitors encounter this kind of Egyptian mummified human remain. Haba, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes. So I'm Heba Abdel Gawed. I'm an Egyptian Egyptologist who specializes on the dispersal of Egyptian antiquities from Egypt to the world through British colonial powers. And I do specialize or I'm particularly interested in how Egyptian, contemporary Egyptians perceive and represent ancient Egypt today. Please do note that images used in this presentation include materials associated with Egyptian human mummified remains. Next slide, please. So here at the Getty, much of my research focuses on the history of ownership of the objects that are now part of the collection. This is something that we call their provenance. But provenance is really just one part of the lives of the museum collection. As I mentioned earlier, today we'll look at the history of one Egyptian person's linen wrappings, a section from which you see here, and what it means to consider and work with this wrapping um, today. So this is again one of the wrappings of Tetasiris, son of Tetasiris, and in the name of the deceased actually appears in the middle of the vignette um, below. Um, beneath his depictions, you can see the striding man to the right of the reclining cow. You know, I think especially in America, there's this concept that museums really aren't museums unless there's a mummy or a dinosaur or preferably both. Um, so encountering the dead has really, I think, become an expected part of the museum experience. And wrappings like this, which were used to wrap the body of the deceased and to provide him with ritual spells to help him achieve a blessed afterlife, are often how visitors um, really experience and frame ancient Egypt. By the 18th and 19th century, these texts fascinated European collectors who had access to the grotesque trade in mummified human remains from Egypt, um, which is how many of these came into collections today. Um, next slide, please. Here at the Getty Villa, visitors over the past few months have had the chance to learn from the Book of the Dead in one of our current exhibitions, images from which you see here. This exhibition takes visitors through these ritual Book of the Dead spells found throughout the Getty's collection on papyrus, um, on bandages like this one, on a Nushabdi, and on coffin elements. So again, these are spells that could um, take many different forms um, and be transmitted in many different ways. None of these had ever been displayed before. Ancient Egyptians, though, would know these as spells for going out in the day or spells for going forth by day. Um, that is the Book of the Dead. Um, that's, a, that's a modern parlance. Um, and please check the chat for links to dive deeper into this. Next slide, please. So what are these wrappings? Um, as I mentioned earlier, the context was part of the funerary setting. The body of the deceased, Petosiris, was mummified and wrapped with these bandages before burial to aid the spirit of the deceased to navigate to the afterlife. Um, and the vignettes show different spells. Um, so this the one we looked at earlier has spell 17 with the deceased um, and Nile gods. And I think it's important to foreground that we are starting with a person. This is a real person who was stripped of this wrapping. And today we're gonna end with real people um, who aren't always connected with their own heritage and museums. But the story of how this wrapping moved to Los Angeles is a complex one. So what we do know is that the bandage left Egypt by the mid 19th century, as it then formed part of the collection of Sir Thomas Phillips in England, who you see here whose life was dedicated to creating the largest private library in the world. Um, this was a rather wild assemblage of things um, with probably hundreds of thousands of fragments, books, manuscripts, and more. And it included many Book of the Dead scrolls and over 50 partial and complete um, wrappings like this one. Phillips was fascinated by the Book of the Dead and the then niche work in understanding ancient Egyptian texts. Um, but this focus on the wrappings as example of text to the exclusion of all else, I think really underscores how easily the human being behind the bandages was lost and ignored. Um, next slide, please. So Britain had a really active but very poorly documented market for mummified human remains and for funerary texts. And it's possible that Phillips, who never traveled to Egypt himself, may have acquired these wrappings through a British diplomatic figure. 
However they got to Phillips, I think it's important to acknowledge here that this represents an act of violence, right? That in the 19th century, an Egyptian was robbed of their funerary accompaniments that had been designed to protect them and to assist them in joining a union with the gods Ray and Osiris in the afterlife. Um, but there's a huge amount we don't know about the history of these wrappings. We don't know who discovered it. We don't know what the context it was discovered in or when. And we don't know exactly what happened next. Um, but what is clear is that it starts with this violent act of extraction. Um, fragments of linen wrappings made for Pet Osiris can now be found around the world. So in London at the British Museum, at the University of Notre Dame in Indiana, in Newark, New Jersey, in private collections, and um, as we can see on this screen, actually a recent discovery um, from the past couple of years with the assistance of Foy Scalf. Um, so it left, you can see the end of one of the wrappings now held by the Getty, um, which actually physically joins to a fragment now part of the Teese Museum of Classical Archaeology in New Zealand. Um, so they originally formed one, one complete wrapping that at some point was broken or ripped apart, um, separated over, over decades or over centuries and split across the Pacific. And Heba, do you want to share with us more about the 19th century and how these ancient Egyptian human remains were treated? Uh, next slide, please. So to take us from what um, Zuzi has been telling us, we need to reflect on how the human remains should be perceived as displaced human beings, because this is what the act of extraction and the act of export of these human remains from their homeland in Egypt to anywhere around the world and to most of the world, uh, one would say, that it is an act of colonial violence, but this was not the only act of colonial violence that they've been subject to. So for example, during Victorian times, when there was this public and scientific fascination with the Gothic culture and equally what happens to bodies after death, mummified human remains became, and it's very sad to say so, but they, they were very much in fashion. To the extent that uh, unwrapping parties where the mummified human remains would be um, totally unwrapped and exposed, used to take place either for scientific lectures or even for just um, to throw a party that is for just for, in, for, the, for the pleasure of any enjoyment. And we've got this extract from an, an archival, the archival records of uh, South London's Horniman Museum and Gardens, where it gives us a glimpse of what exactly used to happen to these bodies at the time. So the bodies were removed, as we can see, they were removed from the case and then they were placed on tables. The bandages then were being removed and the actual body was exposed. At the end of the party, there were giveaways. And guess what? G guess which giveaways would be given to those who have been attending the parties? Like parts of the wrappings were uh, cut and given to the visitors as souvenirs. What is equally interesting in this archival record here, this extract, is how it does mention the name of the human being who's been totally exposed and unwrapped and their dignity and uh, consent is totally ripped away. He's identified, she is identified as a human being and she actually had a relative in the nearby British Museum a few kilometers away. So when we think about it, there were familial connection even when they were becoming uh, human remains, there was still a familial collection, a family connection that they could make. Next slide, please. It wasn't just also unwrapping, but not only were they exposed, but they were equally crushed into powder in order to produce the color brown that we see in many of the paintings from the 18th, 19th, and 20th century. So many of the portraits that you would see in national galleries around the world today uh, the color brown that you'd see in them, this is an actual crushed, mummified Egyptian human remain. And to the extent that we used to, they used to call the color brown, mummy brown. And this, this is this is produced in the 20th century, right? So we think of this yeah. as being this like yeah. historic act, but actually like... Yeah, it stayed, no, yeah. Until the early 20th century, this was very much uh, still in action and it was, it was still in use for, with, for paintings as well even until the early 20th century. So this isn't even, yeah, so this isn't even really a very abstract, a sort of sense yeah. ago. So this is something that's, that's It's very on. vivid, it's very alive, and it's something that we can still see. So next time you're visiting an, um, a national gallery, please do stop and reflect on the color brown that you'd see there. So stepping forward to today and looking at museums, um, where is the debate happening around human remains at all in museums? Next slide, please. 
Okay. So what is happening at the moment is that we're trying to move more or museums are trying to move into to rehumanizing the human remains that instead of perhaps uh, referring to them as just mummies, they are given the names if they are individuals that we happen to know their names through um, archaeological remains that were discovered with the bodies or if the bandages still have some remains of hieroglyphics, then we could tell who is this individual. So currently the label would have the name and there would be an acknowledgement and equally there would be um, perhaps a warning for the public visitors that they would be encountering a human body that uh, reserves or deserves respect. Within the museum sphere, a sphere as a practice, we are currently grappling with the question of should we be displaying human remains or not? And uh, this has been taken into, even to the public level, as we could see here from this um, extract of newspapers, that it is taken equally to the public. The public are being introduced to the question and are being involved into this debate. But what is really, for me, um, and I can't really say interesting, but what's extremely ironic is that unlike any other human remain from any cultures, that you would, that the question would be posed initially to the indigenous communities from where those or for who those human remains are perceived as ancestors. This is never the case with ancient Egypt. Egyptian mummified human remains are perceived as uncontested and unclaimed, as if they are totally orphaned and they've got no modern community to claim them back. Uh, next slide, please. So yes, contemporary communities or contemporary Egyptians, and this is a comic that we created, reflecting on how it was a response to the these, the, the, the news that were coming out in 2021, particularly after a lot of studies, particularly in the UK, in Manchester, that were a bit unethical, that they were trying to reconstruct the voices of ancient Egyptian uh, mummified remains. And the question was posed ethically by the museum association if this is ethical or if human remains should be uh, studied altogether or should be displayed altogether. But there was never a mention of the contemporary Egyptians. What do the contemporary Egyptians think? What are their views? What? How do they perceive uh, this matter? What should happen in light of what the contemporary Egyptians think of the ancient Egyptians? We are totally out of uh, the equation and extremely isolated from these conversations. And next slide. And I think this could go back to how the ancient Egypt that we see in museums today is more of a concept. It's not a culture, not even a country. It's just a concept that is frozen in time and place. It is orphaned. It has no connection to any other layer of contemporary or even um, later Egyptian history that is not pharaonic. It's uh, denied any continuity, any change. It became part of the Western European human civilization. It became so much appropriated that visiting an ancient Egyptian gallery growing up anywhere around the world was becoming a rite of passage. You would need to visit an ancient Egyptian gallery that has an ancient Egyptian human remain. This is part of how you grow up. This is part of your rite of passage that you become an adult. You have to visit an actual ancient Egyptian human remain in one of the galleries. And this is obviously because of, of the scale, the large scale and scope of dispersal of ancient Egyptian materials from Egypt to the world. So, for example, at the British Museum, when you enter, that would be this huge panel there. and. At the very top, it's inviting you to visit ancient Egypt. And then at the very bottom, you would see the word mummies. And all of the other cultures are just sandwiched in between. What is very important for you to visit is ancient Egypt and the mummies. But equally, not only is Egypt orphaned from contemporary Egyptian communities and society, but it's equally orphaned from the rest of world cultures. We never see ancient Egyptian collections as part of wider world culture. And the signage here at Liverpool Museum says it all. So for example, when world cultures go right, ancient Egypt goes left. There is no connection. It's just a concept. It's not a culture in and of itself. Next slide. So I wanted to bring us back here to the Getty um, and to our exhibition, The Egyptian Book of the Dead. Um, we don't have a collection of Quranic Egyptian material here, um, but we do have this current exhibition that looks at material from um, Quranic Egypt 
um, this temporary special exhibition that looks at um, looks at these at these at these materials. Um, and so visitors in the galleries um, can actually interact here with a digital interactive, um, which we hope vi helps visitors to at least better contextualize the inscribed wrappings on display um, and to visualize their kind of intimate connections to the ancient Egyptians who created them and who were buried with them. Um, and I should say that this was created um, by curator Sarah Cole together with Egyptologist Boyce Galf, the animation team BN, and the Getty's interpretive content education and programming teams. Um, because of course, anything that you see in the galleries is really the work of, of many dozens of hands and teams um, together. Um, and here, Pat Osiris is foregrounded as the protagonist. So this is um, a kind of animation that shows you the, the detail um, that we've been looking at throughout this program. Um, so you can see his name there. Um, and uh, this kind of animation, this colorized um, sort of view of him as a striding figure. Um, so he's foregrounded as the protagonist and it follows the wrapping story up to the present day as best as we can reconstruct it. Um, and I would add that as somebody who is not an Egyptologist by training, that I'm really grateful to have a for her work in this field um, because I think we need to humanize and respect the people behind all of what you see in museum collections, particularly for those associated with human beings like this. Um, as part of this discussion, we've added the names of the deceased into the records for these objects. Um, so at least we've been able to better foreground, again, the, the people who, um, who these are made for. And we're working to consider and update the language around human remains in the collection with much more work to come. I know that I personally have changed the language that I use on tours and that I use with visitors in, in speaking about these, um, these objects that are associated with mummified human remains. Um, and I look forward to many future conversations and discussions. But, so next slide, please. How does this all fit into kind of contemporary Egyptian thinking and practice? So skipping from Malibu back, back to Egypt. Back to Cairo, yes. I think for me as an Egyptian and equally an Egyptologist, it's, it's extremely frustrating the extent to which we're totally disenfranchised and totally uh, isolated or dismissed from any conversation that has to do with ancient Egypt. And upon reflection here, you would see on the left, spell 15 and 16 that comes from uh, the wrapping bandage of Petusiris that shows the tuba, uh, which are the souls in ancient Egyptian uh, mythology, and they are carrying uh, the song god Ra. And you could see the very same uh, birds or the bar souls. You would see them in Hana'id Begum. And Hana'id Begum um, is a renowned Egyptian visual artist who was part of the 2011 uh, revolution in the, producing much of the graffiti art um, at the time. And she had a very special interest, I wouldn't say in connecting, but she tends to reflect on contemporary Egyptian issues, but equally while bringing in ancient Egypt and usually as a solution. So for her, the return of the soul of the Egyptian identity could, could only happen if it's returned to the ancient Egyptian soul as in the ball. So here you would see a group of contemporary Egyptian uh, women who represent the majority of the population, and one of them is holding uh, a bust of a female uh, ancient Egyptian statue. And on the statue, it's uh, she inscribed the word in Arabic explosion in figure. And she refers to how uh, contemporary Egyptian identity could explode if it doesn't go back to its root of ancient Egypt. And equally refers to the burdens that usually ancient Egyptian women and contemporary Egyptian women tend to carry in the making of uh, the Egyptian civilization. And I wouldn't say that I'm using this to, that I need to bring evidence that Egyptians are connected to their heritage, because I don't think that we should be proving that we have or that we perceive the ancient Egyptians as our ancestors. I just want people to reflect more on how connections to genealogy or connections to ancestors mean different things to different communities. And perhaps for us in Egypt, it's a connection with the land. It's a connection with the Nile, the, the, the natural resources and the environment around us. But it's equally a connection of the lived experience that we share with the ancient Egyptians of both of us living on the same land, using the same natural resources. And the emotional link or the emotional connection that we ourselves as contemporary Egyptians have with ancient Egypt that this could be the basis on which we could we should be perceived as a community of descent and thus centered in any conversation that 
is related to ancient Egypt, be it the heritage or the human remains. I think, Judy, now that uh, next slide, because we've been reflecting when we were discussing in preparing this talk, how we don't want to present so many colonial violences and equally present the audiences with too many problems without giving any solutions. <laughs> so we felt that we could introduce or propose um, what we perceive could be more appropriate now when you are encounter when on your next encounter of a mummified Egyptian remain. So what we propose you can do on your next encounter with an Egyptian human mummified remain. So you can be empathetic. You can remind yourself that these are displaced human beings who had families, they had connections to a land and wishes for their bodies after death. You could equally recall the violence they faced from removal from their graves to destruction of their bodies to public exposure. And you can reflect on why contemporary Egyptians are often denied their ancestral links to ancient Egyptians and excluded from discussions about the ethics of their treatment and their display. So we've started with a single wrapping and we've really broadened it to these very big questions and then these big um, concepts and the need to keep discussing um, and improving. Um, and I think it is important to remember that when we visit museums, when we display things in museums, we're creating a dialogue, right? You as a visitor by participating in our, in our exhibitions um, are also in communication with and in dialogue um, with those exhibitions. Um, so with that, we'd like to turn it to the audience for all of your questions. Okay. I can just quickly address the language on the wrapping. Um, it's written in hieratic. I believe it's Middle Egyptian. Yeah. There is also an interesting question on mummy paint. Uh, yes, some of the artists did, some of them didn't actually know when they were using uh, the paint that it came from crushed uh, mummified human remains. And when they when they became aware of it, it, be it became so problematic for them to use it, but it continued to be in use, actually, the pain, sadly. Yeah, there's sort of, there's a, a story, I think, about a Priyafra LA painter having like a funeral for a tube of mummy brown, but I think it's telling that it's sort of this like isolated one-off incident in which this sort of one person comes to this realization that's not just a euphemism about the color. Yeah. Um, and again, it did continue being, being produced into the 20th century, um, so it, you know, presumably had an audience for, for many painters in, in different fields. Um, uh, I think this would be a question to me. Isn't it true that the Egyptian museum itself displays numerous mummies? Yes, that's that's very true. Uh, we have, I don't know if you've, of, if Andrea, if you've seen the, um, the Golden Parade that happened during, in, it was 2021, I think, April. The mummified human remains that existed in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo have been moved to uh, the National Museum of Egyptian Civilization, where they are in a better display, which they are still in display. And I think this is why we felt that this talk is important. It's because that we shouldn't be just focusing on to display or not to display. It is an important question, but there is no one answer that fits all. But equally, before we reach the point, if should we... Uh, uh, display the material or not, we need to discuss what happened to the material and what led us to the point that we are at today. And we need to make sure that we include the diversity of the Egyptian community together with the rest of the world into the question and reflect on how we should get on with resolving the issue of Egyptian mummified human domain. I think here we're reflecting more on we need to start a dialogue between the public uh, and the museum practitioners, but equally centering the contemporary Egyptian communities rather than trying to find a solution. Because there would not be a one single solution that suits all museums or that is acceptable for all members of the community. We have another question here. Sorry, just a, a specific one on the wrappings of Petosiris. I should say it's not thousands of fragments of wrappings going to Petosiris. Um, although there are there are a considerable number of them. Um, the fragments all come from, they're not all, they're from different wrappings. There's a number of different wrappings um, that are numbered, um, that have different spells on them. They all come, they would have all been associated with um, the singular mummy of Petosiris, then of Tetosiris. 
Um, there are, there have, these have long been studied. Um, there are different websites and publications um, that have helped us digitally reunite them and we'll be working, there's a forthcoming catalog on the Getty's Book of the Dead collections um, in which uh, FOI will be publishing a sort of complete reconciliation of all of the known fragments. Um, there is a, a question here. Is the connection you feel with ancient Egypt widespread in Egypt or is there still learning Egyptians must go through to become more respectful to? I think we should be all, us Egyptians and everyone else, we are still in, um, we are still grappling with what respect entails because it's, it's, it's quite subjective and it could have um, cultural, social and equally political side to it it's really tricky but um the feeling of connection with ancient egypt i could say from the research i've been doing that it is quite widespread but uh what one can define as respect is quite subjective it it depends because even within the egyptian the wider egyptian community there are a, a variety of groups and multiplicity of voices too so respect could mean different things to different people And there's a question about the language that I use on tours and the language on labels. Um, I I would say that I personally have been trying to move away from using mummy. You'll notice that we only used mummy kind of here in reference to quotes or kind of historic instances of it. That I'm I'm, I'm following Hubba um, and her work on on you know using language that again um, centers on the person. So the fact that these are mummified um, human remains. Um, uh, and I'm certainly trying to come to it. You know, provenance often can feel very, it can feel very isolated from really the events that are affecting an object. Um, but I think here where you have something, you have an action that's clearly a very violent action that's taking place. That's not an ownership. Um, it doesn't become part of the provenance, but it's it's a, this, you know, really important part, this really um, central element to how these objects how these wrappings joined the Getty's collection. Um, and so I, I think it's less, you know, it's maybe not a change in language, but a change in how I approach it, a change in trying to, to broaden it beyond sort of the strict speaking of provenance and really emphasize the, the total lives um, of these objects, where they are in the past, where they are today, um, and again, what that does mean for their future. So that's Sorry, there's a lot of questions, guys. Yes, I know. <laughs> We're trying to keep I mean, up. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm, I'm, hopefully you um, found it interesting. I think, yes, the, there is a question. I, I can't find it again, but it mentions something about using um, the mummified human remains as medicine, which is true. Yes, it was, it was, it was the bodies, the human remains were crushed to be used into medicine. Yes, and there is a remark on, yes, um, the reference of to pharaonic Egypt uh, in the talk today and how it's, yes, it, well, it's more appropriate to refer to it, to it as ancient Egypt, yes, but um, in public lectures like this, if we refer to pharaonic Egypt, it's mainly to make sure that this is widely understood by everyone because ancient could mean that it dates back to the Greek and Roman time of Egypt, but when we focus on pharaonic, we refer to the history of Egypt from the first till the 30th dynasty. That's what we, uh, that's what is um, generally referred to as pharaonic. Uh, do you want to take a question, Georgie? Um, I sort of just a couple of notes. There's some comments on the use of, of mummies, um, mummy for medicine. Um, so yes, there is a much broader story about the, the trade of, of mummified human remains. Um, and certainly uh, medicine was a part of that for a very long time. Um, so you see it becoming part of apothecary um, sets. Um, you see it, um, I think, continuing for a number of centuries. So, you know, the, the art side is just one side um, of a very um, complex um, widespread trade um, and the exportation of, of mummified human remains both to Europe and to the Americas. There is a question here that asks if there was a public debate a century ago regarding uh, the display or no display. Mm. Yes, it, it wasn't in reference to, uh, I wouldn't say a public debate, but we find in many of 
the archival records, particularly the travelers' diaries, that some of them, well, actually, after they've already uh, smuggled a human remain into the boat and in their way from Alexandria back to the UK, it's usually the British archives that mentions this. They would be, they would feel, they would regret taking a human remain with them. And sadly, it was mostly because of the smell <laughs> that it brought to the boat. But many of them were grappling with the question of whether it's ethical to take a human remain back home with them or not. But this actually didn't stop them from taking the actual human remains. So there was a debate, I wouldn't say a publicly wide debate. It, not everyone was questioning this, but there are individual cases where some of the collectors and travelers, they themselves were, were self-reflecting on the ethics of what they were doing. There's a, a question about mummies, um, sort of movies about mummies, I think popular culture about beings who come back to life being so popular. And I would just say again, I think sort of, again, this this kind of fascination um, with with mummified ancient human remains from Egypt, um, it's, it's, it's all, there's these, people feel like they can create these narratives and these stories around them, these kind of fantastical, um, inaccurate, you know, I think it's all part and parcel of how people find them popular because people have felt free to project these kind of imagined worlds and to kind of disregard the settings um, and the people behind behind these mummies. Um, and so, the, you know, there's this very popular, they become this very popular trope, but of course that's really, again, speaking to how people feel free to pluck and choose and, and take these um, these images and, and these this kind of these bodies out from their, their original context. But Heba, I'd be curious to know what you, if you have anything. Yeah, I think it's it's uh, it's it's again it's this dehumanization of ancient Egypt. It's a concept, not a culture. This is why it becomes acceptable that we represent um, a human that is mummified and wrapped as a scary ghost. It became so normalized that people don't notice how disrespectful it is. I think, and that is part of the issue. That is part of what we need to unlearn. We need museums need to help us to unlearn all of these tropes. And perhaps this is why a conversation like what we're having today is important and many other, and hopefully there will be other conversations on the ethics of these displays. And there was a question also about how, like we wouldn't have known much about um, ancient Egyptian culture if these human remains were not retrieved and studied. Yes, because there are non-invasive ways of uh, researching human remains that apparently takes place through CT scanning. And even this for some is not perceived as ethical, but I have to say the sheer amount of human remains that is being extracted and exported is in a way unnecessary because today in many cases we find museums contacting us that they happen to find a body part or um, a, a wrapped human remain in, in a cupboard or in a closet that they discovered it by chance. The, the scale and the scope of dispersal of these uh, human remains is unnecessary that it stops becoming um, for the pursuit for science. It, it becomes more of a fascination with it. It's, it's um, rather than it being for science, given the sheer amount of human remains that, is, that are being extracted and exported or that are being extracted even today, which I think is problematic and I remember as part of our my work, we've been interview, interviewing um, in Egyptian contemporary Egyptian excavators who work on archaeological excavations today. And uh, the Rais, or the head of the excavation, he told me how that whenever they discover a mummified human remain, they stop working and they wouldn't take the mummified human remain outside and they would wait for the foreign archaeologists to come in and to retrieve the body from uh, inside the tomb or from inside the shaft where it was discovered. Contemporary Egyptian excavators, um, while excavating, they never touch the human remains. But we do have contemporary Egyptian conservators who work on the human remains, but they've been trying to find um, ethical ways of doing it. For example, some of them start uh, uh, um, asking for permission from the human remains to proceed before they, they do. And I understand that this is problematic, but we equally need to remember how the ancient Egyptians left us clear instructions of what they need to happen, what they want to happen or not happen with their bodies. And I think we need to reflect on the concept of consent 
and the fact of does consent do you lose your right to consent if you if you are once you're dead you 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 lose your right to decide what should happen and not happen to your body i don't know it's just i don't have an answer it's just i'm thinking out loud with everyone i mean i think that's one of the things we talked about here is there aren't simple answers to a lot of these questions right um and yeah. to be in truth i think if you were to ask these questions three years ago probably answers would be different and probably if you ask them again another three years the answers will probably be different yeah right? Yeah. Um, I don't think any museum or anyone working with this material, with this material, with these people should be like, well, that's it. I've made up my mind. <laughs> like, this exactly. is how I'm going to treat yeah, it. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, that, that, that's what I mean. There is, there is no one, there is no quick fix and there is no one um, solution that would fit all situations because there is equally the contemporary Egyptians who live in the diaspora who would be interested on having these human remains nearby where if they've immigrated somewhere and they would wish to have an opportunity to pay their respect and to visit these human remains, maybe not on public display, but somewhere um, discreet and quiet within uh, museums. I don't know, it depends on the agreement they would all come up with. But I mean that circumstance, circumstances change and communities change and we're all allowed to change our opinions and perceptions. So there is there, nothing is set in stone, I would say, when it comes to um, ethical issues of this kind. And how about, I think there's another question. Oh, goodness, sorry, there's so much, there's so many questions, um, which is really exciting. Uh, there was a question about contemporary displays. Um, where did it go? Um, oh yeah, the one that said if there are, uh, Connecting contemporary with contemporary Egyptian yes. culture. Yes, yes. I know this is something you spent a lot of time working on. <laughs> yes, because we've we've been working we we've been working on this uh, uh, since 2020, and we're hoping to have one on display at the Horniman at the Horniman Museum and Gardens in the south of London at the end of this year, and hopefully it will stay uh, on display for two years. And that would have we would be using the archaeological material at the Horniman together with the more recent 20th century material they've got together with new acquisitions from contemporary Egypt today and we would have them all in one display that would be in the world gallery rather than in the ancient Egyptian gallery or <laughs> something to make sure that ancient Egypt is more contextualized with wider world culture and there have been a series of exhibitions actually happening here in Cairo which is called the Forever is Now and there was a recent one in October uh, um, that was that was introducing how contemporary Egyptian artists use ancient Egypt in their um, artistic interpretations or artistic interventions today. So there is a current wave because you would see fashion line, Egyptian fashion lines that are inspired by ancient Egyptian motifs, uh, equally jewelry. Um, I think this happened as we are trying to redefine the Egyptian identity or rediscover what it means to be Egyptian today. We've been doing this over intensively over the past 20 years, and there has been a wave of rise of ancient Egyptian inspired contemporary material uh, more recently. So, so yeah, this is happening. It's not as much as I wish it is, but it's a good start. That's really exciting. Well, I hope we all have the chance to at least see images from the yeah, exhibition, yeah. even if we can't travel in person. Yeah. There's a there's a question around um, the use of, of human mummified human remains versus mummies. Um, do you want to, since you've published on this, do you want to kind of walk us through that language? Yes. Um, it just the word the word mummies comes from the very same colonial violences or these colonial perceptions that existed early in the 19th century and the 18th century and continued actually up to the early 20th century. And given the the cognitive uh, response that we all have to the word mommy today, the first thing that comes to one's head would be this scary ghost. I feel that we need to um, abandon this word because it equally dehumanizes. It, we, we forget that the mommy is a commodity. The mommy is an object rather than a human. But the mummification was a process and it was a very important process through which 
the ancient uh, Egyptian would be converted into a divine entity. So to dilute it into a scary ghost uh, that is extremely disrespectful is is a violent act of reference, I would say. So I would that's why I called for, or we called me and Alice Stevenson that we were calling for a more respectful terminology that we know it's cumbersome. It's quite a long, it's it's quite a long terminology to call the mummified human remains, but it's what we believe is more respectful than the word mummy, which um, converts them into a commodity, into an object rather than human beings. So I think we're going to be on our last question here. And I want to thank everyone again for all of your questions. I'm sorry we can't answer them all. I think there have been some questions around um, displaying remains and how museums can label them and warning um, notices around them. And I would just say that I think that's something that's changing um, very quickly in a lot of museums. I know there have been a lot of really great discussions um, about that with, with colleagues in the Netherlands, um, with institutions in Australia. Um, so I think, you know, if you're encountering a mummified ancient human remains in a, in a museum near you, um, you should take the time to look and see if there is signage, how it's displayed, um, and think about that. And I would expect to see changes in a lot of galleries. I think it's safe to say moving forward around how these um, are displayed, uh, if they're displayed at all, um, and how the histories of these collections are discussed. How about anything else that you want to add? Yeah. Any well, last questions? I think, I think there is one that says, uh, call them mummified or embalmed per persons. Yes, that's exactly what we mean by mummified human remains, mummified human or mummified embalmed, per embalmed persons. There was a question that was extremely interesting here, but um, which I might not be able to find it again. Thank you, everyone, for all. These so are many extremely, questions. And they are extremely interesting. And I wish we had the time to respond to them all. Um, Yes, where the mummified human remains part of the system of partage. Partage, for those, for the other members of uh, the audience who are not familiar with the terminology, partage is the system where um, the exca or the finds that came out of the excavations were divided between the foreign excavator and the Egyptian authorities. So 50% would go to the Egyptian authorities and 50% would be uh, the property of the foreign excavator. This was because most of the foreign excavations were self-funded. They, they were the ones coming with their own funding to excavate in Egypt rather than the Egyptian government offering funding for them to operate in Egypt. And yes, mummified human remains... Um, well, they were part of the system of partage, but what we know now with modern, uh, contemporary, more recent research for our project, the Artifacts of Excavation, is that most of the mummified human remains left Egypt um, illegally. Most of them were smuggled outside of the country or left uh, through the market. They, they haven't gone through the legal, uh, the legal ways of uh, export of fine as what depending on how you perceive legality or what was perceived as legal at the time. So no, most of the material left Egypt not through the legal framework. Okay, so and with that, we are definitely at time. Um, so we'll go ahead and wrap this up. Um, thank you so much, Haba, for this talk and for all of our other previous discussions leading up to this. I'm so grateful that you could come speak with me and with our audience here um, at the Getty and all over the world. Um, and to everyone out there in the audience, thank you for watching and for submitting your questions. Please remember to visit getty.edu for information about future programs. Um, and thanks so much again. Thank you. Thank you so much.